Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is labor market economics and conservation. This module will have three lectures, markets for the factors of production, earnings and discrimination and income inequality and poverty. So let us begin with the markets for the factors of production. Now we are studying topics such as the market for the factors of production or poverty or inequality because they have a very large bearing with conservation. And in this context, it is important to remember this chart. Poverty is closely related to environmental degradation. Now, this is because if there is poverty in a society, it would mean less per capita resources, which in a number of cases would also translate into overpopulation. Now, what we are saying here is that in the case of poverty, people have less amount of resources that are available with them. They do not have sufficient money. They do not have sufficient other resources. Now, if the resources are less in a society, then that might result in an overpopulation. Now, this might appear a bit too far-fetched, but in a number of societies, what we have been observing is that the human populations go through a demographic transition. Now, what is a demographic transition? In the case of primitive societies or poor societies in today's time, what we observe is that a child, when he or she is born, does not have a very good chance of living till adulthood. Why? Because parents are poor, so the child in a number of cases is malnourished he or she does not get sufficient amount of food. Now, because of malnourishment, the child easily falls sick. Now, if the child falls sick, either he or she does not get to see a doctor because in this society, the per capita resources are so less that the society does not have hospitals, it does not have doctors. Because hospitals and doctors, again, they require money to be, uh, to be there in the first place. They are also resources. So when we talk about a dearth of resources, we are not just talking about a dearth of money, but we are also talking about a dearth of these resources, resources such as uh, resources for education, resources for health and so on. So the child who has fallen sick does not get to see a doctor. And in a very few uh, situations where he or she does get to see the doctor and the doctor prescribes medicines, then probably the parents are unable to pay for it. Now, when you have a situation where children regularly fall ill because of malnourishment and they regularly are denied hospital care because the hospitals just do not exist or when they exist, then they are a bit too pricey for their parents because of which they become unaffordable. What will happen? In a number of situations, children will die. Now, if children die and they die in large numbers, they have a very less life expectancy. In that situation, if the society has to continue, then it will have to compensate at some point. Because if, say, uh, most of the children have a life expectancy of, say, 10 to 12 years, in that case, the next generation will not have sufficient number of human beings. And ultimately, the size of the population will go on decreasing with time. So to compensate for a very high death rate, the societies tend to have a higher birth rate. That is, if each parent finds out that on an average, uh, four out of five children die, that would mean that if the parents have 10 children and eight die, at least two will remain. If the parents have 15 children, and 12 die, at least 3 will remain. So having more number of children is an insurance 
that at least a few of the children will reach their adulthood. Now, when we have a situation like that, then there is also a good chance of overpopulation when the society moves towards the phase two of the demographic transition. Now, what is phase two of demographic transition? Earlier, we have we, we begin with a very high birth rate and a high death rate, but then slowly and steadily, when the population does get some resources, when it does get the benefits of medical advancements, and we are not talking about hi-fi medicines or hi-fi operation theaters, we are talking about things such as clean water, things such as sufficient amount of food. So once the society starts to get sufficient amount of food which reduces malnutrition and thus diseases or once the society starts to get clean water or a bit of sanitation or even things like soap then that would drastically bring down the level of infections that we see in the society because of that the death rate would go down now the society that was earlier having a very high birth rate and a very high death rate now is having a situation where the death rate is going down but the birth rate does not go down as fast so in such a society you will have a very high birth rate because it started with a high birth rate and we are having now a reducing amount of death rate so a high birth rate and a reducing level of death rate would mean that in total there will be a net growth of population which might even give rise to an overpopulation because these days we have at least some level of medical advancement we have at least some facilities that we as a society provide to most of our people so uh, government programs ensure that people have access to clean water people have access to sanitation so in that case, the death rate goes down and there is a chance that there will be more uh, growth of population. Now, of course, every society has to go through these transitions or most of the societies go through such transitions. But then what happens is in the third phase, the birth rate starts to go down because now people don't have no longer a need to have more and more number of children because they are now more assured that a number of their children will be able to reach to the adulthood. So even having one or, or two uh, children is good enough. And once we have a situation of a reduced birth rate as well, then the population becomes stabilized. But in the intervening period, there is a chance that the population will rise. And which is what we are observing here. Less per capita resources could lead to overpopulation. There is also another thing that might occur in, in certain situations. When the per capita resources are less, then in a number of situations, people want to have more children also because these children will provide hands to work in the fields. So to increase the resources of a family, it is prudent and remember that in economics, we always begin with the assumption that people do rational thinking. So rationally, if they have more number of children, that would mean that at least their fields will get plowed and at least their fields will be sown with crops. The crops will be taken care of. So it is prudent for the families just because of rational thinking to have more number of children when they are more poor which is what we are observing here. So less per capita resources could lead to overpopulation. Now, in the case of an overpopulation, there is an extra stress on the land. Why? Because more number of children does not just mean more hands to work the field. It also means more mouth to feed. So when you have a society where more number of children are being born, a society which has a large population, in that case, there are a number of mouths to feed. There are a number of bodies to clothe. Which means that the level of resources that is required in total will increase. Now, here still we are having low per capita resources. But the total number of resources 
that is needed is given by total resources needed is equal to per capita resources so this is resources per unit population multiplied by the population size now in this case even though the per capita resource requirement is less but because the population size is more which may it means that the total resources limited are very high now where will these resources come from where will we get sufficient food for all these people now remember here that when we are saying sufficient food it is not sufficient food when we talk about a biological sense so people are not getting sufficient food they are still malnourished but they at least need that amount of of food that can uh, remove their hunger so when we talk about just feeding the people that in total would require a very large amount of food because the population size is large and how are people going to get that large amount of food well by uh, by taking out resources from land so in that case a number of forests will be cut and they will be converted into farmlands which is what we are observing here land and environmental degradation so there is a greater stress on land and this will lead to land and environmental degradation now this is even more so because there are less resources that are available with people in this society if the resources were more then probably the same amount of agricultural land would have given a higher amount of crops through the application of fertilizers or pesticides or modern machinery but because the per capita resources are less it would also mean that the stress becomes even more because of a, a less amount of productivity so this leads to the land and environmental degradation where more and more uh, forests are destroyed and they get converted into farmlands and these farmlands are just working on a subsistence level which means that even when people work on large sized farmlands they do not still get sufficient uh, output from the land because the productivity is less and also because in a number of cases the forests uh, are there in those lands that were not that much fertile because if the lands were fertile then people would have actually converted them into farmlands way back so only the best lands are preferentially converted into agriculture so the forests that still remain are there on those lands that are not good enough for agriculture so even though there is an expansion of uh, agriculture and there is a huge amount of land and environmental degradation there will be a further loss of productivity because these expansions are being made in those areas that are even more infertile and when we have a loss of productivity that would further accentuate the poverty so this cycle it becomes a vicious cycle and it goes on and on and it is important to remember here that poverty is also a part of this cycle and land and environmental degradation are also a part of this cycle so poverty is closely intimately related to environmental degradation which is why it is important for us as conservation economists to know what causes poverty and how can we solve poverty so to understand poverty we need to understand the labor market economics so what is labor market economics what is labor market so if you will remember we had talked about the circular flow diagram now the circular flow diagram is a model of the economy in which we have firms and firms are those parts of the economy that produce and sell goods and services and hire and use the factors of production a good example is an industry that is making uh, things such as a pen now this industry is producing a good and to produce the good it is hiring labor it is making use of other factors of production such as land and capital 
and by using these factors of production it is churning out pens and it is selling them out in the market so that is a firm the other component is households who buy and consume the goods and services that is the households will purchase this pen and they own and sell the factors of production such as land labor or capital so the people who comprise the household they have their labor to sell and they sell their labor to the firms and so we have two kinds of markets we have the market for the goods and services and services that you are very much aware of because in the good market for goods and services the goods and services are sold by the firms and bought by the households so if you go to the market and purchase a pen then that is a market for the goods and services so in this market there is a firm that is selling you the pen you are purchasing the pen and so you are paying the uh, the firm with money so in this case the household spend so you are doing the spending and this spending becomes a revenue for the firms but there is also another market which is the market for the factors of production in this market the households sell the land labor and capital which means that people in the households will offer their labor so they will offer to work for say wages or they will offer their land on rent or they will offer their uh, capital which is with them that is the money that is with them for a pro for a share of the profit so when a household invests in uh, say a company's shares then it is investing in this market because it is giving the company its money in the form of its capital in return for a profit from the shares now in this market the land labor and capital are sold by the households and they become the factors of production for the firm and in return the firms pay wages rent or profit which becomes the income of the households now in this module we are concentrating ourselves with this market the market for the factors of production and we are asking the question that if there is a household and this household is a poor household what are the factors that determine how much money this household will get in this market because this is the market in which the household is earning so what determines what will be the level of wages that is received by this household what will determine the level of profits that they receive what will determine the rent that they receive if they give the firm their land to establish a factory now that is the question that we are asking because that has got a lot to do with the level of poverty that is there in this household so if the wage rates go up if people start to earn more in that case the per capita availability of resources will increase for the household and when that happens it is possible that the household will no longer remain poor and if the household is no longer poor then the pressure that they are putting on the land and environment that will go down which will have important ramifications for things like conservation so we will have less of our forests that will be deforested to convert into farmlands and we will have less number of people who would be willing to go into a forest to cut wood for fuel wood so this is very important ramifications so what governs the wages rent and profit in this particular market now we begin by defining a few terms the factors of production the factors of production are the inputs that are used to produce goods and services input used to produce goods and services now what are these inputs these inputs include things like land labor and capital and when we talk about the this market we are talking about the demand and supply for land labor and capital that will determine the prices that are paid to the land owners workers and the capital owners so what we are saying here is that just like in the market for goods and services here as well we have a demand and we have a supply 
and this demand and supply will determine at its equilibrium what is the equilibrium price and what is the equilibrium quantity and we are interested in knowing the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity capital is defined as the equipment and structures used to produce the goods and services so it is the equipment such as tools and structures such as a building so if there is a factory that is residing in a building so this building is the structure and the equipment or the tools that they are using all of these are known as capital so capital is the equipment and structures used to produce the goods and services and in the market of uh, for uh, labor or in the market for the factors of production what we are saying is that there will be a demand there will be a supply and on the y axis here in place of the prices we have the wages because the price that is paid to the workers is the wages that they get so that is there on the y axis and on the x axis we have the quantity of workers which is telling us the level of employment that we will have or how easy it will be for a person to get a job in this market so these two things the demand and supply in the labor market will determine the wages that people get and whether they get the wages at all or not that is whether or not they will get some sort of an employment through this market or not to understand how demand and supply are regulated in the labor market let us take the example of a firm that is a labor intensive firm such as a firm that is making samosas now for our study we'll take the firm to be a competitive profit maximizing firm now when we say that the firm is competitive it means that it is a price taker so it does not have a huge amount of market power and the price that has been determined by the market for uh, for the product that it is making that is the samosa is fixed so let us say that one samosa can be sold for 5 rupees in the market so competitive means that this firm is a price taker and it is a profit maximizing firm which means that the decisions in this firm are taken on the basis of rational decision making processes that is the firm tries to maximize the profit that it has now in this chart in the first column we have the number of workers now the firm can have zero workers it can have 1 2 3 4 5 6 or n number of workers now because the production of samosas requires labor so if you have the firm with zero laborers then probably the uh, amount of output will also be zero so in that case we are just taking this value of zero as a theoretical construct it is not a practical construct because you will not find a samosa making firm that is not employing anybody so if the number of laborers is 1 then the output or the number of samosas that are being made in this firm per hour is say 50 now when the firm hires more number of laborers then the output will increase but it will not increase in a regular fashion as in it will not double when you are doubling the labor that is there being employed now why is that so because there are a number of considerations labor is not the only factor of production you also require things like labor uh, like land and capital and perhaps they will start to show their uh, limitations in a very short period of time so if there is a firm that has a kitchen and this is not a very big sized kitchen so if there is one laborer he is making 50 samosas if there are two laborers then it is possible that there will be a small shortage of space that is the two might start to bump against each other or they may start to chit chat because you have two people so they will naturally start to have some conversation 
Now, when they are having a conversation, then that is a time or that is an effort that is being removed from the process of samosa making and diverted into conversation. Or it is possible that now the laborers, they are not getting everything right there on the spot and one laborer starts to make the samosa and the second one starts to move things around. So it is possible that the efficiency may go down, which is what we are observing here. So with one laborer, the firm was putting an output of 50 samosas per hour. With two laborers, it is putting an output of 90 samosas per hour. It is not putting an output of 100. With three laborers, the output has increased further, but it has only increased to 120. <coughs> with four laborers, it has increased to 40. Now, what we are observing here is that the increase is going on, but it is becoming lesser and lesser with time or with more and more number of laborers. Why? Because when you have just two laborers, then probably the space is not that big of a shortage than if you have, say, five laborers. So when you increase from one to two, the space is not a shortage. But when you increase from five to six, probably it has become a bit too overcrowded. So in such a scenario, the laborers are not able to have sufficient space to make the samosas which is what we are observing here. And from this, we can compute the marginal product of the labor. Marginal product is the change in the quantity divided by the change in the number of workers. So when you move from zero to one laborer, there is an increase of 50. So delta Q in this case is 50, which is 50 minus zero. Delta L is 1 minus 0, which is 1. So in this case, the marginal product of labor, MPL, is delta Q by delta L, which is 50 minus 0 divided by 1 minus 0, is 50 by 1 is 50. When the number of laborers increases from 1 to 2, then the output increases from 50 to 90. So in that case, the MPL is delta Q by delta L is 90 minus 50 divided by 2 minus 1. Because earlier the Q was 90 and now the uh, earlier the Q was 50 and now it is 90. So delta Q is 90 minus 50, which is 40. Delta L is 2 minus 1 is 1. So this is uh, 40, which is what we are observing here. So the marginal product of labor in this case is 40. When the number of labor is increased from 2 to 3, then delta Q in this case is 120 minus 90 is 30. Delta L, because we are increasing one labor at every point of time, so delta L is 1 in each case. So essentially for this laborer, the third laborer, the marginal product is 20 uh, is 120 minus 90, which is 30 divided by 1 is 30. For the fourth one, it is 140 minus 120, which is 20 divided by 1 is 20. For the fifth one, it is 150 minus 140, which is 10 divided by 1 is 10. For the sixth one, it reduces even further. So what we are observing here is that the marginal product of labor is going down. Or in a sense, what we are seeing is that when the number of workers is increased, the output per hour, it increases, but it goes on becoming flatter with more and more number of workers. So this is known as the production function. The output versus the number of workers is the production function. So we are observing that the output is increasing, but the rate of increase is decreasing. So it is increasing, but earlier the increase is very high when you add one labor, but later on it becomes lesser and lesser. The marginal product of labor is the increase in the output, in the amount of output from an additional unit of labor. Increase in output from additional unit of labor. So you are adding one more labor. What is the increase in the output, which is what we calculated here. Now, 
here we can talk about the law of diminishing marginal product what does that mean it is the property whereby the marginal product of an input declines as the quantity of the input increases which is what we are observing here as the number of laborers increase the marginal product goes on decreasing so it is the law of diminishing marginal product diminishing means reducing so it is the law of reducing marginal product with more and more labor the marginal product of labor goes on decreasing and the reasons include things like crowding insufficient access to equipment chit chats and so on so probably there is only one mixer or probably there is only uh, one stove or say let, uh, let us say that there are only two stoves and if you have six laborers then not everybody is having an access to the stove at all times so you ha can have the diminishing marginal product because of crowding physical crowding or insufficient access to equipment or because of chit chats and so on and if we plot the marginal product we observe that in the first case the marginal product was 50 then 40 then 30 then 20 so it is decreasing with an increase in the number of workers so this is showing us the law of diminishing marginal product next we can define the value of the marginal product which is the marginal product of an input times the price of the output now in this case the firm is interested in maximizing its profit so what the firm does is is that it is doing a calculation of what is the amount of output that i am going to get with each labor and what is the market value of that output that is if an additional labor is going to produce say 30 samosas and one samosa is uh, will, will be sold for 5 rupees so the so the value of the marginal product of the labor is 30 samosas into 5 rupees per samosa is 150 rupees so that is the value of the marginal product the marginal product of an input times the price of the output which is what we are showing here the value of the marginal product of labor is 50 into 5 now here we are taking that one samosa is 5 rupees because this is a competitive firm so it is not able to change the uh, market prices and at the same time uh, there are so many number of buyers that if it is producing more number of samosas that it is not changing the price of the samosa so whether it sells one samosa or whether it sells 1000 or 10,000 they will be sold for 5 rupees a piece now this again is a theoretical construct we do not observe such scenarios in the market but for the simplicity sake we are taking that the price remains constant so the value of the marginal product of labor is shown in this column so if the marginal product of labor is 50 then 50 into 5 is 250 if MPL is 40 then 40 into the price 40 into 5 is 200 30 into 5 is 150 20 into 5 is 100 10 into 5 is 50 and 5 into 5 is 25 so this is how we compute the value of the marginal product of labor and similar to what we observed in the case of the marginal product if you uh, plot the value of the marginal product of labor we will again find a diminishing curve now this is expected because there, there will be no difference between this curve and this curve it's just that the first curve the marginal product is multiplied by a constant value in this case 5 rupees because the firm is a competitive firm and it is a price taker next we have the wages now we can have the prevailing wage rate and suppose the wage rate is 100 rupees so if we plot 100 rupees as this green line then the profit maximizing quantity of labor in this case will be given by this point where the, both the curves are intersecting each other now why is that so well when the number of workers is increased from 0 to 1 now this first worker is able to produce a good 
that is, that can be sold for 250 rupees and the wage that has to be given to hire this labor is just 100 rupees so when the number of labor is increased from 0 to 1 then the additional labor is producing something that has a much greater higher value of the marginal product than the wage rate which means that if the company or the firm hires this labor and uses this labor to produce the good, then the company is adding to its profit. And we began by saying that this is a profit maximizing firm. Now, when the number of workers increases from one to two, then the second worker that the company, if it hires, will produce a good that is worth 200 rupees more than what uh, the first labor was producing so the first labor was producing good of 250 rupees the second labor is producing a good of 200 rupees so totally the good that is being produced is now 450 rupees worth but to make this extra good of 200 rupees the company has to pay 100 rupees so this difference is the profit of the company or of the firm so for the first worker the profit to the firm is this much for the second firm the profit to the firm is this much for the third worker he makes the good worth 150 rupees and the company has to pay 100 rupees so the profit to the firm is only this much in the case of the fourth worker he makes the value of the good is 100 rupees but to make that good the firm will have to pay 100 rupees of wages to the worker so now the company would be in a dilemma because whether it hires this worker or not there is no change in the profit but if the company or the firm hires one more laborer then the value of the good is 50 rupees but the firm has to pay 100 rupees so this is the level of loss to the firm so at this point the firm was at a profit at this point the firm is at a loss so this becomes the profit maximizing quantity and at this point the firm may or may not hire the labor we can also look at the marginal profit in each case so what is the marginal profit it is defined as the value of the marginal product of labor minus the wage rate the prevailing wage rate so if we did this computation for the first labor the value is 250 rupees the wage is 100 rupees so the marginal profit is 150 rupees that is if the company hires this labor then by hiring one unit of labor the company will increase its marginal profit or will increase its profit by 150 rupees so that is the marginal profit for the second labor the value is 200 rupees the wage is 100 rupees so you can think of it as the value of the product that you are buying from the market and the cost that you have to pay so in this case the value of the marginal product of labor is the value to the company and we had seen even in the case of the market for goods and services if i'm going to the market to purchase a pen and the value of this pen in my eyes is 30 rupees and the cost or the price at which it is available is 20 rupees then i will buy this pen but if the value in my eyes is 30 rupees and if it is available for 50 rupees then i will not buy the pen and this is exactly what we are observing here if the value of the marginal product of labor is greater than the wage that is if the value is greater than the price that needs to be paid then the company will or the firm will buy this good in this case it is the labor and the marginal profit for the second labor is 200 minus 100 is 100 for the third labor he makes goods worth 150 rupees and the company has to incur a cost of 100 rupees so in this case the marginal profit becomes 150 minus 100 is 50 and we are observing that the marginal profit is reducing with each extra labor because of the law of diminishing marginal product 
for the fourth labor if the company hires him then the value of the uh, of the marginal product of labor is 100 rupees the wage is 100 rupees which means that the company will earn a marginal profit of 0 rupees which means that before the company hires this labor and after the company hires this labor there is no change in the profit and with an extra unit of labor now the company is incurring a loss because the value of the marginal product is now less than the wage rate which means that in the case of our pen example the value of this pen is 30 rupees and it is now available for 50 rupees or say 40 rupees so if it is available for anything more than its value then i am not going to purchase it and similarly in the case of a firm that is there in the market to purchase labor if the value of the labor is less and the price of that labor is more in this case the value is the value of the marginal product of labor and the price is the prevailing wage rate so if the value is greater than the price the company will buy the the labor if the value is less than the price then the company will not buy the labor of this person so as the number of laborers increases to 6 then you have uh, the situation that the value of the marginal product of labor is 25 rupees the wage rate is 100 so the marginal profit is now minus 75 rupees so this is what we are plotting here the marginal profit versus the number of workers and the, pro uh, the profit maximizing quantity is given by this point where the marginal profit is zero. So at all the points to the left of this point, we have that there is a positive marginal profit. And a positive marginal profit means that by adding one more unit of the uh, labor, the company will add to its profit. And to the right of this point, we have a negative marginal profit, which means that if the uh, firm adds the, the labor, then it will reduce its profit. And we began with the assumption that this firm is a profit maximizing firm. So when the marginal profit becomes negative, then the, uh, the firm will not hire the labor. So the demand for the labor will be determined by the value of the marginal product and the value of the marginal product is a marginal product multiplied by the price of the output so in this case the labor demand will depend on the price of the output so if the price of the output is more then the demand will increase now suppose in our example the p in place of 5 suppose it was 10 so if we compute for p p is equal to 10 then the value of the marginal product of labor in place of 250 it would be 500 here it will be 400 because what we are doing is 40 into 10 is 400 30 into 10 is 300, 200, 100, and 50. So this is the value of the marginal product of labor. Now, in the earlier case, we were observing that when the company hires the fourth labor, then the value of the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage rate. But in this case, when the company hires the fourth labor, the value of the marginal product of labor is greater than the wage rate. So the fourth labor is definitely hired. What about the fifth one? In the case of the fifth labor, the value of the marginal product is equal to the wage rate. So now one more labor will uh, is going to be employed by the firm because the price has increased. And because of an increase in price, it reflects in the value of the marginal product of the labor and we have seen that the profit maximizing quantity is where the value of the marginal product of the labor is equal to the wage rate so if the wage rate remains the same and if the price changes then this curve the red curve it will shift upwards which will change the number of labor that will be hired by the firm at the profit maximizing quantity
so the labor demand depends on the price of the output more is the price of the output more is the demand for the labor and also on the marginal product now marginal product in turn depends on labor productivity such so as including technological changes and it depends on the supply of other factors such as raw materials now what we are observing here is that the marginal product depends on things like labor productivity now in our example if the labor productivity was more that is the number of samosas per unit uh, per hour if it increases because the marginal product of labor increases so what we are saying is that in place of making just 50 samosas if this laborer was more trained and suppose he was able to make 70 samosas similarly if this one was able to make say 60 samosas if the next one was able to make 55 samosas if the next one was able to make say 50 samosas if the next one was able to make say 45 samosas now in this case if the price remains the same we are again talking about a price of 5 rupees now what happens to the marginal product of labor and suppose the next one was able to make 40 samosas now in this case the marginal product of labor will be given as for the first one it is uh, 70 into 5 is 350 for the second one it is 60 into 5 is 300 for the third one it is 55 into 5 which is 275 for the next one it becomes 50 into 5 is 250 for the next one it becomes 225 and for the next one it becomes 200 so this is the value of the marginal product of labor if the price has remained the same so the price is 5 rupees only but the marginal productivity of labor has changed so we have increased the marginal productivity say by providing more training to the labor now in this case if the wage rate remains the same then even the sixth labor will be hired because the marginal uh, because the value of the marginal product of the labor is 200 rupees whereas the wage is only 100 rupees so what we are observing here is that if you increase the marginal product of the labor or if you increase the price of the output the value of the marginal product of the labor increases and this would change the the demand for the labor it would determine how many labor are going to be employed and the marginal product can can increase by increase in productivity or it can increase by the supply of other factors such as raw materials so what we are saying here is that if the labor gets trained or the labor gets say uh, a better stove or the uh, or we increase the supply of other factors such as say the fuel then the total marginal product for the labor would increase and even if the price remains the same the value of the marginal product in this case will increase and we have seen that if the value of the marginal product of labor is greater than the wage rate then the person gets hired if the value of the marginal product of labor is less than the wage rate then the person does not get hired in the case of a profit maximizing firm so this determines what will be the number of labor that get employed now so far we were looking at the demand side what about the supply side the supply of labor depends on a number of factors such as the trade off between work and leisure or the value that is given to leisure now if we have a society in which leisure is given a very high value so people put a very high premium on the time they are able to spend in say chit chatting or watching movies or with their family or say wandering around if this uh, leisure is, uh, is put at a premium then people will have less incentive to leave this premium of leisure and go and work so it would depend on how much is the premium that we pay to leisure in a society now in certain societies we say that work is worship and so people are more 
incentivized to work because of the social setup but in certain other societies it is possible that there is a a social norm of uh, valuing leisure at a very high premium in which case people will be less inclined to work it also depends on the social tastes and traditions whether women prefer to work outside home or not whether they are permitted to work outside or not by the society so that will also determine whether or not women are there as a part of the labor supply pool or not in certain societies we can have uh, a situation where even teenagers go out to work so in that case the labor supply will be more in certain other societies the teenagers just do not go out to work so the labor supply will reduce in certain societies people put a very high premium on education so in that case people even in their early 20s will not be available in the labor supply pool so the social taste the traditions also determine to a very large extent the amount of the supply of labor then it also depends on the changes in the alternative opportunities that people have with the end of the agricultural season the labor supply to the industries goes up why because the uh, the amount of employment that was available to in the agricultural sector that dries up because the agricultural season has ended so when that happens the supply of labor for industries it increases and it also depends on immigration and the movement of labor so if more people come into a society or in a country say through immigration or through movement inside the country so in that case the labor supply will increase so there are a number of things that determine the supply of labor and as in the case of uh, the market for goods and services here again we have an equilibrium in the labor market so there is a demand for labor there is a supply of labor and the point where both of these curves intersect this point will give us the equilibrium and at equilibrium we will have the quantity of workers that are demanded so the, uh, this is the quantity of workers that is demanded or supplied which tells us the equilibrium employment in this particular market situation so this is the number of workers that will get employment and they will get employment at a wage that is uh, at a wage that is given by this equilibrium wage so this is the equilibrium wage and the equilibrium employment and just as in the market for goods and services we can have a shift in the labor supply the supply may increase the supply may decrease for example in the beginning of the agricultural season the supply of labor to the industries will decrease at the end of the agriculture season the supply of uh, labor to the industries will increase if we have alternative employment opportunities then the supply of labor will decrease to firms so there are a number of ways in which we can have a shift in the labor supply and we can also have a shift in the labor demand so a good example again talking about the agricultural season if there is the beginning of the agricultural season then the demand for labor for working in the agricultural sector will go up so the demand increases in this case at the end of the agricultural season the demand for uh, labor in the agriculture sector will go down now when there is a shift in the labor supply so a shift in the labor supply is shown by these red curves so if there is an increase in supply it is shown by this shift to the right if there is a decrease in supply it is shown by this shift to the left now if demand remains the same and we have an increased supply so in that case this is the new equilibrium so in this equilibrium more number of laborers they get employment but the equilibrium wage rate is less so with an increased supply with no change in the demand we will have more number of workers that are employed but at a lower prevailing wage rate on the other hand if there is an a decrease in the supply such as uh, in the beginning of the agricultural season uh, the supply of the labor to the industries decreases so in that case less number of 
workers will be employed in the industry but they will get higher wages similarly when there is a shift in the labor demand so if there is more demand more demand is shown by the demand curve that is shifting to the right so this is an increase in demand with an increase in demand the equilibrium shifts and this is the new equilibrium this was the old equilibrium now with the new equilibrium the equilibrium quantity of workers has increased so more number of people get employment and at a higher wage rate on the other hand if there is a decrease in demand as shown by a shift to the left in the demand curve so we have this new equilibrium and at this equilibrium this is the equilibrium quantity and this is the equilibrium wage so if the demand decreases then we will have reduced wages and less number of workers that get employment a good example is uh, the employment in the agricultural season uh, in the agricultural sector at the end of the agricultural season so we can have a dip, a change in uh, or a shift in the labor supply and demand and that will affect the equilibrium and that will affect the number of workers that are employed and also the prevailing wage rates now similar to the uh, market for labor we have a market for land so when we talk about the factors of production or the market for the factors of production we have three factors of production land labor and capital and similar to the labor market we also have a land market we also have a capital market now in the case of the land market we have a demand for land and we have a supply of land and both of these curves they intersect together and this gives us the equilibrium quantity of land that is supplied to the firms and the equilibrium price at which the land is supplied now in a number of cases the firms do not buy the land but they take the land on rental basis which is a lease so in uh, most of the situations we talk about the rental price of land which is how much you need to pay for a fixed piece of land say per year or per decade so in the land market we have uh, an equilibrium quantity of land and we have the rental price of land similarly in the capital market we have the demand for capital we have a supply for capital both these curves intersect at this equilibrium point which gives us the quantity of capital that is uh, demanded or supplied by the market and the rental price of the capital now in a number of cases this rental price is the interest rate that the firm is going to pay to get this capital so if say a company raises a debenture and in the case of a debenture if you buy a debenture then the company will pay you an interest rate now that is telling us the equilibrium price for the capital now if the company has a very huge demand for capital then probably they will be paying a more price so this equilibrium in the market will tell us the quantity of capital and the rental price of the capital and just as before the demand will depend on the value of the marginal product of the factor that is in question that is the value of the marginal product of land or capital if the value of the marginal product is more then these factors will be in more demand and probably the firm will be ready to pay a higher price if the value of the marginal product is less for any of these factors then the demand will be less and probably the company will be ready to pay less amount now for a competitive and profit maximizing firm each factor's rental price equals the value of the marginal product of that factor so we have seen it in the case of labor the value of the marginal product of labor is equal to the fact, uh, the labor's wages so the company is going to hire only till this point where the value of the marginal product of the labor is greater than or equal to the wages or is greater than or equal to the rental price 
of the factor of production. So the factors earn the value of their marginal contribution to the production process. And because these three uh, factors of production, land, labor and capital, they are linked together because all three of them are together needed for production. So in this case, the supply of any one factor can alter the earnings of all the other factors. And a good example is an epidemic that reduces the labor supply. So if there is an epidemic and people are dying or people are sick because of which they are removed from the labor market. So in that case, the supply reduces. Now, when the supply reduces, the marginal product of labor rises. Why? Because of the law of diminishing marginal product. If you have more labor, then you have less marginal product. And marginal product, remember that we are talking about the product uh, the production that is being made by one extra unit of the labor. So if there are more number of labor, then the uh, the uh, the, uh, the amount of production that is made by one extra unit is less. So it means that if you have more labor, then there is less marginal product, which means that if you have less labor, then you have more marginal product. And if you have more marginal product and everything else remaining the uh, remaining same, that is the price remaining the same, the value of the marginal product will increase and this will increase the wages. But because of a shortage in the labor supply, the marginal product of the land will decrease. Why will it decrease? Because less labor is able to work the land. And in this case, there will be a decrease in the rent. And similarly, the marginal product of capital will decrease because less labor is able to work the capital. And so they, this will decrease the return on the capital. So what we are observing here is that if the value of the marginal product of any factor of production, it increases because of a change in the supply and we are taking the example of an epidemic that reduces the labor that is available. With less labor available, we have a greater marginal product of labor because of the law of diminishing, diminishing marginal product. And in that case, the value of the marginal product of labor increases, which will increase the wages that the labor will get in the market. But because less labor are available, so the value of marginal product of land or capital, it will decrease because less labor are able to work on the land or the capital. And so the productivity of land or capital will decrease, which will reduce the rent or the returns for uh, the land and capital. Now, such an analysis is known as the neoclassical theory of distribution. So, what are the salient points that we have seen so far? The amount paid to each factor of production is derived from the supply and demand for that factor in the market. So, we have seen before that there is a demand and there is a supply and both of these together are telling us the amount that is paid to each factor of production which is the rental price or the wages. Demand for a factor depends on its marginal productivity because if the marginal productivity is more then the demand will also increase. And in equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to the production. So you earn more if you contribute greatly to the production of something that is valued high. Meaning that if you have a larger productivity and the product that you are working on or the product that you are making has a higher price in the market, then because you are making more of those goods that are priced higher, you will earn more. And the corollary is that a person will earn less if his or her contribution to the production is less, meaning that the productivity is less or the product that is being produced has a lower value. 
so people who work in the primary or secondary sectors of the economy that make such products that have a low value in the market will earn less and especially so if their productivity also is less so this helps us explain why there is poverty in the society and as we have seen poverty has a great ramification for the cause of conservation so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai